Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Going Ballistic Podcast. You made it to episode number 82, and I got to start off with some bad news. Twyla isn't here with us. I know everyone loved having her on last podcast. We loved having her on. We'll try and get her back again. You're stuck with me, Ryan Kleckner, and our co-host, Jason Kleckner. Jason, how you doing, man? Good, man. I'm actually doing real good. Good. You've been so, tired and working too much for the past few podcasts. This is good to hear you in good spirits. Well, actually, uh, it's funny, man. I not not gun related, but I wouldn't play to my first foosball tournament last Sunday. Okay, and I knew you already took foosball too seriously, but now you're in a tournament. That's very serious. So yeah, I wouldn't play in a tournament. Uh, they have a whole ranking system. Uh, I did pretty good. It was good playing against guys that were way better than me. And they wanted me to join a league on Tuesday night. And I was like, yeah, I can't do Tuesdays, man. I got something a little more important on Tuesdays uh, I got to do. I appreciate it, man. If you need to miss it for it, we understand. We appreciate it. Every night you get a chance to hang out with us. It's pretty cool. But they were like, no, come on, man. I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, you don't understand. Tuesday nights are already spoken for. We Any other nights, we got a podcast. That's right. So, what did, <laughs> you said we needed a third podcast now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some, some people reached out and they said, so you have trigger words. We have going ballistic. And now we need to have drinking with Twyla. So <laughs> I got more than one comment about calling uh, those hunters <laughs> numb nuts. <laughs> I thought that was funny. So yeah, it was great having her on. And then I had a couple people get mad at me for being too serious. They're like, Ryan, now once Twyla's on there joking around, you're trying to be all serious. I'm, okay. <laughs> yeah, somebody has to keep the balance, right? Yeah, yeah. It was great having her on. So we'll get her back. We already got folks joining us on the live YouTube feed of the podcast. That's awesome. Lots of chats already coming in. Hello, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Um, Brett, glad we're going to be able to keep you company tonight on your drive. Uh, Jared starts us off right away. He really wants to know this, the answer to this question. He already asked it twice. Uh, caseless telescoping ammunition. Thoughts. Have you seen that before, Jason? I don't know what the telescopic is. I've seen caseless ammo. I've mm -hmm. seen the guy that built the prototype that can essentially fire one round or five rounds. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know, man, I'm, I'm kind of old school and mechanical always works. And I think that's mechanical too, but the way they seem to be pushing it is going to be electronic. Yeah. The, a lot of the caseless ammo is electronic. So HK had a design in the nineties that fire looked like little like foam earplugs is what it was right. or like a sterno tablet. It was like a sterno tablet with a bullet in the middle and it would you know, ignite. Now the, the beauty of that is you don't have any ejection problems or extraction problems, right? Two right. of the eight cycles of function have been removed. So that's kind of cool. Um, it never took off. Remington tried electronic ignition called the e-tronics. It was still a, essentially the same case cartridge case design, except the primer was replaced with an electronic primer. And I think they even sell those electronic primers still for people that want to reload them. And just a battery ignites it. I think they're ahead of their time on that one because it makes sense. We didn't used to trust electronic stuff, right? So when Remington came out with the electronics from the 90s with HK, people were like, oh, electronics with a gun. You can't trust electronics. Well, now look at what our soldiers using, are using now. They have multiple electronic devices on them to which they have to trust their life to. I mean, I, I would trust my life to an Aimpoint Red Dot site all day. That's an electronic device. So I think right. we've gotten to the point now where they're more rugged or where we've accepted them more. Maybe it's time to bring it back. I've, I'm, I often say that or remind people that we're still using the same cartridge design that the Cowboys used, right? right. A piece of brass with a primer, some gunpowder and a piece of lead flying out the front. Now, maybe that's because we got it right and it works. So why change it? But the other side is we have all these advances in firearms, but it's still shooting the same cartridge. Maybe it's time to get a new, better one. Now, the telescoping ones, they're still more like a regular car uh, regular cartridge in how they mechanically fire, but you end up essentially having the cartridge case is the overall length, and the bullet is down in the case. So telescoping is that it kind of, I mean, I guess it doesn't telescope, but as it fires, it telescopes or it extends out. So they should call right. it collapsed. So they took the cartridge, they collapsed it is how they did it. And you see it, you can see it on machine guns and, and belt-fed machine guns. It looks just like a bunch of polymer cases, if you will without a bullet sticking out the front because it's all inside. So what I think about it, if it works, awesome. I just don't know if it's going to work. Uh, I'm all for any design that makes uh, maybe ammunition more reliable, that makes it lighter, more compact. I mean, why not? You know, if it can make it make it better, I'm, I'm all, all for it. See, um, what we need is a, a railgun setup 
Oh, okay. And a, and a hand carried rifle. Now, I'm all for that. Well, that'd be cool. Of course. Of course. I actually uh, just read a, a book. I needed a mental escape. So I asked a good buddy of mine for a book he recommended. And I never thought I liked sci fi books. But when I look back on some of the books that I've really enjoyed, they've kind of been sci fi. So I was like, well, maybe I like sci fi books. So I asked him for a recommendation and he recommended Old Man's War. It was really, really good. Uh, it was about essentially people on earth that when they got old enough, they could enlist in the army. So the, the first sentence of the book, it was very well written. So well written. In fact, I want to keep the book and use it as an example. If I ever get to write a novel or fiction someday, because of how well he developed the stories and sentences and things like that in the book. But the first sentence of the book is on my 75th birthday, I did two things. I buried my wife and I joined the army. It's like, what? And then you get into it. And the idea is they take them out to the space colonies and then they do something that ends up getting them a new, younger, better body, but keeps their kind of DNA and consciousness to the younger body. And they use the old people because your life's kind of ending on earth anyway. So why not? Right. Necessarily over there. So anyway, really kind of cool concept, but their, their gun that they used, he described the gun a little bit is that the magazine was a extremely dense block of like nanoparticles. So he described it as a very heavy rectangular block of what looks just like metal that would go in the gun. And then depending on which setting they set on the gun, it would either instantaneously form into a single bullet, a rocket, a grenade, a whatever, because the nanoparticles would change and create the grenade on demand or create the bullet on demand. And that they had a, a readout in their electronic system that showed them how many bullets they had, how many rockets they had out of that block. And depending on how many they'd shoot of one, the quantities of the others would decrease proportionally based on how many nanoparticles were left. I don't know. Just, it was, it was a stretch, but it was kind of neat. The concept of starting with a uniform fungible building block and then building instantaneously, whatever they needed in the gun. So I know it's sci-fi. You guys might think I'm a nerd for it, but it was a, it was a cool <laughs> book. And then I had somebody reach out, wanted to know if uh, people who shoot six and a half Creed Moors have to have a man bun. No, but it helps. It helps a bunch. Yeah, it helps. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a man bun and I have a couple six upgrade mores. I get it. Uh, but they say that about the CZs too. If you shoot CZs, you got to be a hipster. So anyone that has a CZ is a hipster apparently. So I guess I am I might be hipsterish in the firearms world. I'm trying to picture you with a man bun right now. Yeah. I don't think I've ever had hair long enough to have a man bun. <laughs> I can get one of those clip on man buns and see what people think. So the, uh, the only gun thing that I've done in the last week is we talked about earlier on in the, another podcast, I had a uh, Swiss TG1 pellet rifle mm -hmm. that I was struggling with, and I thought maybe it was the scope that came with it. And you had said, no, it's a brake barrel. Iron sights are better. Well, when I got the gun, the iron sights were kind of in the way of the scope, so I had removed them, and of course I lost them. And I tried another scope ready to throw this thing in the garbage. So this last week I decided I'm going to make my own sites. So bear with me on this junkyard build that I did to this gun. So I took a round push pin for a map, drilled a hole in the front of it, put it in there, took my Dremel tool and narrowed it down to about uh, probably three thirty seconds of an inch, pretty narrow. Then I took some hardwood, built an iron sight. Since it's not adjustable, <laughs> I literally kept shaving it down. <laughs> so ghetto. Yeah. Shaved it down till it was hitting at the height I wanted. Then I added some wood and started with one side and kept trimming the wood back until it hit the spot I wanted. Uh -huh. And then I added another piece of wood. And I got to tell you, dude, I have made the most accurate pellet rifle ever. The fact that the front sight is so narrow and it only has that little tiny sliver that you have to line it up in. There is yeah. no room for left and right error. This That's thing awesome. is is awesome. So how's it working I, for you? I got to try it out a couple of days ago and, and what I like to call an Arizona rock rats that run around. Uh, I popped three of them things at 50 yards and took out two more that were a little closer. Wow. So super happy with it now that I took the scope off. That's awesome. We got to see pictures of this thing. And the whole plan of having a scope was so I could practice more, but it just was not working at all for me. But I'm happy now with my ghetto hardwood 
push pin site that I made that is super accurate. That's funny. Are you familiar with the handy rifle? No. So it's a horrible name. It makes it sound like it's like the handicapped rifle, right? But it's, they try to make it handy. Like it's handy to have around, but they spelled it H A N D I rifle. So, um, it's H and R. It's one of the many Remington companies. And I had, uh, the 300 blackout version, which is really cool. So it's a little single shot break open. You can change the barrels on them. You exposed hammer, you cock it, shoot it, break it open. You got to pull the old case casing out and push the next one in and close it and shoot it again. It's a fun little gun. And especially with a 16 inch barrel, since there's really no action, I can shoulder it and reach out with my firing hand and put my finger over the muzzle. That's how short it is. And it's not an SBR. So it's this cute little gun that you can break down and, carry with you and it's fun to shoot with but it just begs to have iron sights in my opinion i love you you know i like iron sights anyway for the purity of it sometimes and the simple little single shot break open it, i think it just ruins it putting a scope on it. i'd love to have iron sights they didn't never had them so i found a sight base that had a built-in peep iron sight in the back for that gun that i bought online and put that on there but i needed the front sight so i had the access to all the resources at remington to just get me whatever sight i wanted they said of course we'll build you a sight Ryan, and we'll braise it on the barrel and everything, but we need to know what height you want the sight. And so I didn't know. Well, uh, someone already said Ryan's calling Jason Ghetto when I made my cheek riser with wood and tape. Uh, a cheek riser <laughs> is technically part of a stock, and stocks are made out of wood. So come on. Um, so I uh, I decided to do kind of what you did, made a homemade sight. I took you know the mini vice grips. Yep. Vice grip, probably little tiny vice grips. I took those and I vice gripped to the barrel a bolt. So I grabbed the the rim of the top of the bolt and vice gripped a bolt on there so the threads were sticking up. And I screwed a nut on the bolt <laughs> where I thought it would need to be. And I went out and shot and zeroed it by spinning the nut to the right height. Shot an amazing group with it with the ammo. I couldn't believe how accurate it was. And then I took out the little dial calipers and measured off the bolt so I could give them a measurement. And you know what? It's one of those things I never got around to getting built. So it still doesn't have a front sight on it. But yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I've, I've vice with vice grips hanging off the side of the rifle, the barrel and a bolt and a, and a nut people have to be at me at the range on that one. Oh, that's right. I was made fun of for this too, until I started hitting everything with it. So I'm super happy with it. Yeah, you can't complain much if it works, right? No. All right, so someone in the comments pointed out that everyone asked the most random questions, and um, they're right. So, But I'm going to go through some of them because we have a lot of them in here. Uh, Martin asks, can we discuss the practical advantages and disadvantages of front focal plane and second focal plane scopes? He says, from his perspective, it seems like front focal plane is best, or first focal plane, sorry, is be best for DMR-type applications, while second focal plane would be better. Um, no, there's no, it's your preference. Uh, you can save money with the second focal plane scope because they're usually less expensive for the same quality. I mean, if you have the money, go ahead and get first focal plane. That's great. Um, but everything else being equal, the first focal plane is going to be more expensive. And that's because there's more moving parts and it's more complicated to build. So if you get a cheaper one, you could have some accuracy issues because the reticle, reticle could not stay exactly where it needs to be. But it's up to you, man. Um, I've I've done all my learning and all my uh military time i think all of it was second focal plane scopes i don't think we even had a first focal plane i'm not sure uh just be careful what power setting you're on so your preference man um when it comes to milling maybe a first focal plane is better because then you don't ever get on the wrong power but whenever i'm trying to mill a range estimated target i'm always doing it at full power anyway because i'm trying to be precise so it's kind of a, a moot point for me um books coming Book's doing okay. What's really coming along is the ATF compliance course for Rocket FFL. That was going to be a quicker hurdle to knock out, so I'm knocking that out now. I spent all last week, and almost every night I pulled all-nighters. So I got very little sleep last week. You can maybe see it on me now. I'm still exhausted of just pounding out that ATF compliance course. I have so many chapters and so much information in that thing for current FFLs that, Jason, I made a whole chapter just on the 4473. And so there's a bunch of lessons on how to fill it out and what to look for. And at the end, I made a quiz and this took me forever because I filled out a bunch of online, you know, PDF 4473s 
and then had to save them as images, then upload them, then have it to where the image open in the new tab and all that clicking. But for every question, I made like 15 different examples of 4473s. And each one, I made a certain mistake that are the most common mistakes that people make that are hard to catch. So like my my top 15 list of things that are to watch for. So I just made it and made the question. I'm like, hey, look at this 4473. See if you can find the problem. And you have to click on where you think the problem is. And I'll tell you if you got it right or not. And it teaches you. So it may be boring to a lot of you guys, but if you're an FFL and you want help, uh, I hope that's a tool that people like. So I made a lot of progress on that. Um, let's see what else we have here. Sh quick question. She's zero new rifle on cold, mild or hot weather. Doesn't matter. Just pay attention to what the difference in weather is going to be. If you really have a time to make a choice, zero it in whatever weather you think you're most likely to be shooting the gun in. But you're always going to need to know the difference, the velocity of your ammo uh, when the weather changes anyway. So that's what I have to do. Name of the book. Yep, yeah, Old Man's War. Wouldn't you just make every bullet a rocket propelled grenade? No, because you only had like 10 of those per block, Brandon. Yeah, come on. You know, you got to go with it. You had like 6,000 bullets, but 10 grenades you'd run out too soon. Well, you just um, have more blocks, right? Yeah. That's always the problem. Have, how much ammo can you carry? <laughs> I mean, you can never have too much ammo unless you're drowning or on fire. But <laughs> other than that, <laughs> Jared asks, what would I keep in my bug out or bailout bag in my vehicle? Well, there's a lot of stuff I'd keep. That's probably a whole podcast, uh, but it's not going to be the same as you keep. Are you Is this bag to get you home if you're out in your vehicle, or is this bag to hit the road, get away from your home? You know, I'd start with the of the obvious ones, water. You know, food is not as important as people think it is, but water is really important. You can't go very long without water. You can go quite a while without food. Um, a knife, an extra gun, extra ammo, magazines, things like that. You know, a headlamp. So uh, the usuals. I don't have any special voodoo for a bailout bag. Uh, thoughts on XM108 match ammo from Lake City? Well, um, I have thoughts on it. First, the X... I'm going to overstate this, but the X means it's a reject. So a lot of people don't know that. The X in the nomenclature means it didn't make the cut for the military contract. Um, I hear a lot that the X is just an overrun, that there's just extra. But then I also hear from people at Federal that the X means, for whatever reason, it didn't make the specs, but it's still good ammo, so they call it X M1 and 8 ammo. Um, M1 and 8 used to be great stuff until about 2000. 12 about there before then it worked great and since then i hear nothing but problems with it that it's it's okay i mean if you get access to it use it for sure it's not going to be as good as you know gold medal match it's just not but you need ammo to shoot it'll be accurate enough maybe minute of angle minute and a quarter of angle accuracy ammo and it'll be good brass for you so don't don't avoid it just because of that um, what else do you see here, Jason? I like uh, the one from Me Bucks. This is actually a great question where he had a discussion with some buddies. If you sight in a rifle for yourself, for instance, for myself, and I gave you the gun, would it need to be re-zeroed for you? Uh, yes. Now, that's, I should have hesitated um, a little bit longer. Is technically a rifle zeroed? It's zeroed. It just means that the point of aim lines up with the point of impact at a certain distance, which shouldn't matter who's shooting it. The problem, though, is we all look through the scope a little differently. We right. see a little different. We adjust our head a little different. Now, there should be arguably only one proper head spot to be, so it should be zeroed. But even though the, I, I might – here, I'll answer it this way. The optic or the sights and the rifle should be zeroed for everybody. However, since we all have our unique ways of shooting the gun, you should – double check the zero for other people, but it shouldn't be off by very much. It should be off by just a little bit, just by people, how they look at it. Uh, Buster B asks, if he gets an FFL and moves to a different state, will he have to redo the whole process again? No, not at all. We actually cover that in the get your FFL course, how to do that. You can actually just file for an address change and it shows you how to do it in there. And it's actually not that painful. So who has the best factory seconds? You hear mixed reviews. I have, I have no idea, Denny. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I shoot the XM 108 just fine. I'm just letting you know that it's not super match ammo. Um, it's still good ammo though. Uh, Black Hills has really good seconds. The white box Black Hills, if you can ever get that, it's a white box that says seconds right on it. It's really great stuff. Uh, I, I wish they would sell more of that. It's hard to find, but that's pretty good. So, so I want to get to the important stuff, man. When is this Rec 10 coming out? 
I was just talking with Colby Donaldson about the Rec 10 today. Both of us were like, where are Rec 10s at? Because we still don't have them. So I don't know, man. I hope it comes out soon. I know they're huge government contract. They're still fulfilling that. And that's the one I want. Uh, it's an Israeli one. So they're supplying them to the Israeli military. And they're just awesome, awesome, cool guns. So it's like upgraded ejectors and extractors and all sorts of other cool specs on it. So I can't wait to get one of those. So well, Red likes this by Magtech. He's right. Just buy Magtech, guys. Why yeah. did you buy Factory Seconds? That stuff's awesome. We would have. Oh, speaking of Magtech, I was going to bring it up too about uh, Mike Fisher, my 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 good buddy over at Magtech. Uh, he had a picture of him at the range that he texted to us, and I zoomed in because the ammo looked a little funny. But you zoom in, he had the pistol ammo sitting down in the case and covering the entire primer and a little bit onto the rest of the case was this giant gob of primer sealant. So it almost looked like the primers were giant red primers at the back of all the brass. And I responded back via text, holy primer sealant. You know, so if there's a, <laughs> if a cartridge has primer sealant, you'll see it peeking out around the edge of the primer sometimes. You ever see that, Jason? Yeah. Yeah. So like, here's a little known fact. Remington, another thing Remington gets right, is the subsonic versus supersonic 300 blackout. The subsonic has a bluish green primer sealant and the supersonic has a red primer sealant. So if they ever get oh, mixed, up in your, mixed up in your pocket, you can just look at them and you can tell. They don't tell anybody. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't advertise that, but it's hard to look at the cartridge and tell by itself, so you just look at the primer sealant. But anyway, this stuff is just like gobbed on, like more than just a drop. It's coated. It's a giant red circle. And so I, I busting a shop, I was like, holy primer sealant. And he came back and he said, you know, it's actually the spec that the German police wanted. And it's amazing. They said it is phenomenally waterproof. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. Ship me a box of it. And I'll take just have a bottle of water. Sorry, guys, no good liquor tonight. I'll take like a <laughs> glass of water, and for I think like a month would be fair. I'll take a glass. I'll pour the ammo into the glass, coat them completely, submerge them in water, and I'll keep it filled so that every night for a month I'll show the podcast they're soaking in water, and then I'll take it out and from the range I'll reach in the water, pull them out, load a magazine, and see if they fire because that would kill regular ammo. That'd be awesome. So if they say it's completely waterproof, and his response was, yeah, sounds awesome. We'd love to see it. So, guys, if you want to see how good the MagTech is, I'll put it through a test that, like I said, would kill anything else. So we'll see. Yeah, I want to see this test. So Martin says, would I recommend a Remington 700 anymore? Sure, if that's what you can afford. Um, the quality control is gone these days. It really is. You can get a great Remington. Don't get a Remington like a lot of people do and immediately replace everything. Um shoot it first you might have one that shoots so there's no need to replace the barrel unless there's a need to replace the barrel but yeah they they have quality control problems go for a tika go for brigara's um even savages if you're good good guns i like mine mine shoots really well which one do you get savages right uh no, no no i got the 700 sps yeah and it shoots shoots great yeah so don't be afraid not to get one. Get one. Um, especially if you want to build a project. One of the awesome things about the platform of Remington 700 is all the aftermarket parts are so easy to work with. That's why it was such a you know, popular platform when it came out. Like even Glocks. Go get a Glock. You don't like the trigger? You have a million to choose from Brownells. Just use the link at the bottom of our show notes to when you go That's to right. buy stuff. Or you change the barrel. You ch so I kind of look at it the same way. It's a great platform, but... You know, I mean, we're going to be honest with ourselves. I, I, I do lo like Glock pistols, but the sights suck. They're pieces of plastic. They're absolute crap junk sights. So I can't say buy that gun because everything about it is perfect. No, even a gun I would recommend to people getting, I would say right away, though, you're going to need to replace the sights. So with the Remington 700, you might need to replace the stock right away. You know, you might not like the, the trigger, you know, upgrade to a trigger tech. That doesn't mean the gun's necessarily bad. It just means like to play with things. You know, I have my 320 sitting here. I like the flat trigger now. It's warmed up on me. So now I have a full-size X-frame grip with a compact slide with a special grip by Alma Cole and a flat trigger. So I love playing with guns. Um, Let's see that grip on that thing. Looks like uh, it's been bedazzled. It is. Yeah, it's my bedazzled grip. It's like grip tape, but it's permanent. So what he does is he grinds down the grip and make you know changes the the depth for it. Then he masks it off and puts on an epoxy 
and then sprinkles on silica carbide to the epoxy. So it becomes a permanent, ridiculously rough. I mean, this is for tactical competition shooting. This isn't for everyday carry. It'd it'd rub your, your sides raw if you wore it. But so now if you need, I can build you some wood sites for that thing and I'll make them super, super accurate for you. That is a hipster thing. You know, like some people get like the wood frame glasses or like a wood phone case. Jason, you just figured something out, dude. Hipster sites. That's right. Beautiful hardwood, all finished out, clear coated. Oh, you could pick what you want. You could do, you know, like a birch front, so it like is, is a lighter color. Do some a, exotics, mahogany rear. Oh, dude, yeah. now you're thinking. Yeah, e- ebony with like a little dot of elk ivory for the front sight bead. Yeah, dude, Jason, See? hardwood sights. It's hard to shoot good without hardwood. There's, there's your, there's your, there's, <laughs> there's your company motto. <laughs> there's your slogan. That's awesome. B Bucks wants a set of birch sights. Uh, Ripplelang wants granite sights. Wall ooh, in the rear I of the maple granite. front. Yeah. Ooh, you could do like bird's eye maple and get one of the little bird's eyes as the front side post or like a curly maple. Yeah, yeah. Dude, now we're thinking, and I, I think it's it's safe to say that the the market for wood sites is fairly open you're not gonna have a whole lot of competition i don't think i've ever seen it that's what i'm saying you're, you're set dude this is easy you have zero competition you could start right now you already got people placing orders right now rosewood site <sighs> and i would i would imagine that wood sites would be a lot lighter than metal sites right so you could shoot it faster <laughs> People want to lighten their slides, so the slide cycles faster. Well, there you go. It's going to lighten the slide, and now it's like a lightweight accessory for carry, dude. Now, and, now you got to do AR sights, so people that do the ultralight AR 15s you can have wood ones for those. And I can impregnate it with a liquid epoxy, so it's super hard, won't break very easy. There goes Jason trying to impregnate everything. That's right. Somebody asked fact, you. You could do a a rail or a four end for an AR-15 and just have the site be the same piece. There's no reason to have something separate. And Jason, if you did a wood rail, you don't need M-Lock or key mod or rail, or like a Picatinny rail system. You would just take wood screws and screw in whatever accessory you wanted. <laughs> That's right. I right? could actually. Drywall screws even if need be. Yeah, seriously. You just screw the flashlight onto the side. You're good to go. <laughs> I think you're onto something here. And then in a survival situation, you could whittle your hand. I can burn it. it to That's start right. A fire. That's right. Guys, are we the only ones thinking outside the box here? I mean, you go to SHOT Show <laughs> and the industry has just all the same junk. You know. Uh, there you go. Flintstone LLC. I love it. Oh, man. Yeah, play chat. Dude, you, this is this is something to think about here. Yeah, wood tactical guns. That's the other thing is the anti-gunners don't like, you know, AR-15s because they look scary. The more you make it look like, you know, a hunting rifle, you'd be good to go. Now, I have seen the multi-layered wood stocks and four grips for AR-15s. They're beautiful. Yeah, I've like, actually, they do the laminate wood and then yeah, throw yeah. it out. That's funny. But Dude, I want to see, see you make a set of wood sights for a Glock just because somebody will buy them. Matter of fact, put them on your own gun. Who cares? All right. How could you make the front sight stronger? The rear sight, I think, would be okay. The front sight, I'd be worried about. Just getting banged around with a holster or being so thin. No, I've got some um, some penetrating epoxies that uh, I used to use for uh, cracks and granite and stuff that will literally seep all the way into the wood and make that thing like a piece of metal. That's funny. And so for like a Glock, you just make it to where it's got that oval shape on the bottom of the front sight, so it fits in the oval. Right. And you have to put a set screw up in front of the bottom, but you can figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Set screw it or, you know, come up with some way to tack it in there. Or... That's how Glock sites work. So a Glock site just has a screw through the bottom of the slide that holds. And the, the best part in. is, look how much easier it would be to shave down the front side if you needed to. Well, it'd be easy to shave down, but not the other way around. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, so you could bring the group up. You could shave the site down and bring the group higher on the target, but not the other way around. And then you, you know, people are are getting all the ideas here. (laughs) (laughs) Almish Arsenal. That's funny. Balsa wood for an AR pistol. Yeah, get it nice and light. Guys, we're on to something here. Jason, we need to run and hurry up and patent this idea or get it to market, you know, because clearly this is the outside the box thinking. Dude, I'm going to make one. I'm going to. I'm going to see what I can do to make one do just it. to I show it. No, I think it'd be hilarious. 
and you need to take your time on it, make them look nice. So it's like legitimate. Which brings me back to the uh, thing we talked about earlier this week, which is the, uh, now I can't even say it right because I've heard so many different variations of it. The struggle snuggle. I call it the the struggle cuddle, but. Struggle cuddle. There you go. So me and Ryan had come up with uh, animals that should be on the top five. And for me, it was something that you should be able to challenge yourself with and not get mauled. So like a grizzly bear, or polar bear would be, I think, a little extreme and probably wouldn't work out. Uh, you're right, but it makes it hard to get, though. Yeah, but what are the odds that someone's going to choke out a... Oh, which brings me back to the mountain lion. I read a thing that they're now saying after testing it that it was a little baby cub, which was only uh, a few months old, but... Hey, I, don't I'm, believe, I don't care. I don't want to believe it. I want to believe that he wrestled a big one. That's right. right. So which one are we going to do? And the comments are still going and they're making me laugh. I'm sorry, Jason. We have suppressor <laughs> height wood sites. That's the other thing. You could just screw on additional sites. You could. Tap it, put a T-nut in the bottom of it. We need to... How about Beaver Backup Sites, LLC? Uh, anyway, yeah. So the struggle cuddle. Um, big five. Yeah. So some, a bear is too big. What do you think would be good on there then? So we got to have a mountain lion. Right. The mountain so lion the mount, started this. right. The mountain lion is what started the whole thing. So okay. for me, being an Arizona guy, mm-hmm. I thought, you know, a uh, coyote would be a decent one. Um, badger would definitely have to be on there. It would be small enough and hard enough to hang on to. Well, if you're going to go small and, and difficult, wouldn't a squirrel be like grabbing a blender by the base? Like a squirrel, I heard they're pretty vicious, and it's hard to hold. Which I have a hilarious story about that. I'll have to right, share so that. I, I agree with coyote. So mountain lion, coyote, maybe uh, badger, you, but badger might be too hard for some people to get. So, so badger, you, you had a, a wolf in there, which I think... I'll call it the coyote. Situation coyote is right. all over the place. I'd rather do a coyote. All right. right? So, so coyote. I'd rather do a coyote. Um, I think a bird would be funny to put on there. So I put eagle on my list too. We can call it hawk. How a predator, that, predatory bird? Have you seen eagles up close or ever been really close to one? Yes, that's what I'm saying. They are terrifying animals. Yes. So make it a predatory bird, a hawk right. or an eagle or something. You got to choke out. You'd have Maybe. to get a special permit for that one, probably. Correct. Yeah, I think you would. <laughs> okay, maybe we won't do those then. All right. What else? Yeah, you uh, probably can't do something trash panda. Which is a raccoon and red leg says, How about a skunk? Oh, that'd be horrible. That's yes, great that's and the, horrible all at the same that's, time. That's the challenge. That's the challenge. You gotta choke out a skunk while he's choking you out. Porcupine would be tough, raccoon. So okay, so you got the coyote, you got the mountain lion. I would go Deer? Yeah, I think a deer or something well, I'm trying like to think that. What's all over North America. Yeah, a deer. All right, so we got three of them so far. Uh, oh, how about a feral pig? Oh. oh, I love it. Yeah, and we need to get rid of feral pigs, too. Yeah. Opie says a Canada goose. I like that one. A <laughs> goose. goose. We got a long neck. It'd be easier to grab a hold of with both hands. Yeah. yeah I think, a... can, can, we, can we make a goose be part of it, Jason? That could be your bird. Yeah, that's my bird. So we have a mountain lion, a coyote. A goose. A goose, a deer, feral pig, and a feral pig. That's it. All right, guys. That's that. That's the that's the big five. If you get the struggle, the uh, struggle cuddle for the big five, that's what they are. Um, now, why couldn't you choke out a deer? I mean, if you get drawn for a rifle hunt, right? You're allowed to use a bow or anything underneath a rifle. Yeah, I think. You where could. does this? Where does this say you can't use your hands? I don't know. I don't think I've ever read anything that says you can't. Apparently, you can use a rock. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you can use a rock or not, but I would assume you could. I mean, it's it's less than a rifle, right? The, the I think challenge. The, I think the estate game regs for wherever you live might have allowed weapons, but then again, it's not a weapon. I know you can't use anything that would like injure it. Like I could use a pellet rifle or something on a deer hunt, but. I mean, for rifles, there's a minimum caliber for many states. Uh huh. Correct. So it's not a caliber, though. But, like I said, you could use a bow. Well, what if you brought a rifle 
and just screamed out loudly, oh, damn, it jammed as you're choking it. And it attacks me. And yeah. it's rabid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Got lots of stuff to prove. <laughs> yeah, there's a South Park episode where they scream, they're coming right for us for everything. Do you ever see that? Oh, one? that's right. Oh, yeah. That's one of the early ones. <laughs> He's coming right for us. And they just shot everything. So that's what you got to oh, scream. That's right. With AR-15s and my ri- My rifle malfunctioned and jump and... Jared says, good luck. The media would have your head. I don't know, man. This dude that choked out a mountain lion, the media loved him. (laughs) Well, who wouldn't? I mean, come on. Who doesn't want to say they've taken down a mountain lion with their bare hands and have that story for the rest of their days? Yeah, that seems kind of... Well, maybe me. I don't know. (laughs) Put, Put me about 10 yards away from a mountain lion and see if I change my tune. I've been 10 yards from a mountain lion. Yeah, and r- at about that moment, I bet you did not think it was a good idea to charge it and start choking it. Actually, I got a great mountain lion story for you. All right, go. So when I was younger, and I'm going to try to figure out how old I was, I was probably 13 or 14. Okay. And I was in Oklahoma and visiting my mom, and they had some friends who had filed for a permit and actually acquired a mountain lion as a pet. And it was young. Uh, it didn't have its spots, but still a young enough mountain lion. And uh, I got to go in there and play with it several times when we were busy. What? And they said, yes, this that's a true story, man. Does your dad think this was a good idea? Did he know about this? He thinks it's hilarious. So I'm in there playing with this thing. And they were very strict about, hey, you know, sometimes it wants to get a hold of you. And, you know, it it doesn't know the difference sometimes. So don't be afraid to get rough with this thing. If you have to, I'm like, okay. So many times I played with this thing. It was no issues. And they asked me to feed it one day. So I went in there with some raw chicken that they were going to feed it. And I decided to tease this thing with a piece of chicken. Yeah. Cause you're and a it, thing. Yeah. Well, it went and that quick, I mean, a split of a second from, all right, dude, I know we play and we have fun, but you have two choices. Either you're going to drop the plate or I'm going to eat you. And this thing went nuts. Swiped at me, had a claw go right through my shoe, didn't get my foot, but tore my shoe all the way down the length. I'm running, hucking chicken over my shoulder, trying to get this thing away from me. It was amazing how fast it flipped. Yeah, I, it's, it is still a wild animal. Regardless and then, of the pet so in the news today, someone had a lion in their backyard eat themselves a pet lion. Anyway, go ahead. And then, yeah. So then, of course, now that it's not chasing me and eating this chicken, I decided to be dumb and walk back in and just see if it would let me back in the room. Yeah, no. Until it was done eating, didn't want to be touched. But after that, I could go right back in and things were normal again. So wow. that was makes quite sense. the I mean, you don't experience. Mess with the dog when it's eating, things like that. That, that makes right. sense. So what is what were our parents thinking with us? Uh, I don't think they were. I told you I got lowered into a bear cave by my dad. <laughs> no. Yep. Um, <laughs> For what purpose? Well, I have two is stories it... about us. Uh, <laughs> stupid things we did. Were you the one that stuck Terry's foot with a knife? Put a knife through Terry's foot and boot and shoe. Yes, through his big toe at your house on Thanksgiving because we were playing chicken. I, I think, I think the blade made it out of the sole like a little bit or no? Oh yeah, yeah. So we okay, guys. To, to let <laughs> you know, we'll how... get to that one next. Hold <laughs> on, we'll do the deal. Yeah, so there we were playing a game of throwing knives. Um. Anyway, so yeah, we're we're out um probably elk hunting. I was too young to be hunting, so my dad would carry me around on his shoulders, and we're walking along the side of like a cinder road, heading back to camp, in the middle of the day. And there's some rock outcropping on the side of the road with kind of a a distinct crack to it. My dad walks up and looks at it and goes, I think that's a bear cave just by the smell. And he's like, I think the bear is going down in that hole and there's something underneath it. That's amazing. Right there on the side of the road. And he goes, hey, you want to go down in there? So I go, sure. So he pulls out a little mini mag light flashlight, right? And hands it to me and goes, here. So I put the flashlight in my mouth. I grab his hands. He holds my hands up. And he wiggles me to the hole and he slides me down the hole. We have no idea if this thing goes down 20 feet. (laughs) What it does, he he lowers me down in there to where he's like down laying on the ground and my feet hit the ground and it looked like almost a perfect cube. It was amazing. Like straight walls, almost a perfect rectangle. 
it was amazing how the rocket opened up and it stunk in there and there's like there wasn't like a pile of like bear poop or anything in there well, i guess it's because they're not going to go in their own cave but there was hair and matted hair and smell and stuff like that and it was pretty intense and cool to look around i thought it was amazing i was ready to come out i got my hands back up my dad reached down and pulled me back up and out and it wasn't until later and i was like holy crap my dad lowered me down into a bear cave and now people while we're talking about the story we're talking about um my hairstyle i keep calling it a faux hawk it's kind of not a faux hawk see it goes it's normal on the side it just comes to a point and that that hairline i've had that same quote-unquote receding hairline since i was 12 Dude, I think so, it's in our family. I think we all is. have a receding so, hairline. None of us are bald. Except right? for me. I shave mine because I don't like to look at mine. Did you start going bald? Oh, I've been shaving my head for years. I know, but I mean bald from like losing your hair. No, just a receding hairline that oh, okay. comes around. Yeah, but I, I've had the same one with 12. I remember one time I learned what receding hairline was when I was a kid because my dad was describing what I looked like to somebody. And he actually said the words receding hairline. You know, like, what's that? So, no, guys, I'm not losing it. Go look at all my pictures. Same hairline. <laughs> but, oh, well. It's just a big head. That's the problem with it. So, anyway. Well, the, the cave would have been great if uh, you would have heard a, like a brrrr or a growl or something. Then if you, that, it was that pretty would've... small. I mean, I bet it was four feet by like mm-hmm. eight feet. So, I was Still there. Though. Thinking, I can't believe it. So, all right. I mean, so, tell me about Mumbly Peg. That, yes, you <clears> stuck our other cousin... With a decent knife. I mean, I was a kid, so I don't remember it, but I'm guessing a three-quarter inch wide blade. Probably. Bigger. Inch wide it, blade. It was an actual throwing knife, so it was <laughs> inch and a half, probably. <laughs> threw a shoe, threw a foot, threw the sole of the shoe on the bottom. At threw a, the big at toe. A, at a family get together. I thought it was like the middle of his foot. No, no, no. It was his big toe. So when we were younger and dumber and, and did stuff. So we played a game called chicken and you would huck a knife at your foot. And if you moved, you were a chicken. It was mumbly pig. But we were, uh, I don't know. We just called it chicken, okay. but, but we were good enough at throwing knives, me and Terry. So we had spent, I don't know, like a good hour hucking a knife at each other's foot and just sticking the edge of our souls. Right. Never hit each other. So can you explain the game to people so they understand what it is? So we're standing, uh, face to face, and if I had to guess, we we're three feet apart at a family function at, at Thanksgiving. House. Thanksgiving at, like, at your house, us kids running around. You were you guys were probably mid to late teenagers. You're probably seventeen, eighteen ish. Uh, no, I was probably at the time I wasn't driving, so fourteen, fifteen. Oh wow! All right, so it makes me about ten. So yeah, Terry was probably seventeen, eighteen at the time. So we do this for a good hour and we're laughing and everybody's and grandma get, and aunts and uncles walking around. Oh, yeah, yeah. Don't Every, mind the collector boys are throwing knives yeah, at each other. At Thanksgiving. Yeah, don't, don't mind us. I mean, right, so the game always, is you stand face to face and you get the knife as close to someone's foot as you can. And mm-hmm. of course the goal is don't stick their foot, but you don't want to move your foot either. You got to kind of trust the person. So we do this for a good hour and we're laughing. Having I thought a good you had time. To spread your, well, so mumbly peg is you spread your legs. Yeah, yeah, they're spread apart. Okay, but I'm saying you have to keep spreading it to the knife. So oh, like, no, 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 no. You throw the knife. It's got to be within like your fist's length of width away from your shoe. So it's got to be that close. And you move your foot to the knife and pick it up. And before you know it, you're both spread really far out. So whoever falls over or sticks Oh, no, 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 no. We were just literally, how close can we get until we make the other person move? So and you were going back and forth for a while till I mean, we who did thought it would happen? Well, we, we went and ate Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, so we, we eat these big plates and of course we eat, we eat mountains of food when we eat. That's just a collector thing. I think I think but, everyone does that. So Thanksgiving. Yeah. we decide, Hey, let's go finish the game. Nobody's moved yet. So now we're full lazy, just got done eating all this food. So we start back up. Terry actually hits the top of my foot with the knife, but it didn't stick. Right. So that means that might've been why he was off of the same. That means he wasn't committed. Cause if he had right. a committed throw, it would have stuck right. It would have stuck. For yeah, sure, so right. he, probably the not committed throw is why it didn't go. So we're like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. You know? So we decide, okay, we'll go a few more. So we go a couple more. And of course my, I think a second or third throw after that, I literally stick it right through his big toe all the way through his shoe. 
And I start laughing. He yells out. And of course, grandma is standing there. She's immediately upset. So we drag Terry over to your back patio, sit him down, pull the knife out, pull the shoe off. Grandma's wrapping his toe up and immediately yells at us that we are not in the woods. We are not in the woods. You guys don't play like this unless we're in the woods camping. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> right. right so that has been an it's ongoing grandma. joke yeah. yeah an ongoing joke with grandma whenever we go camping hey grandma we're, we're at a civilized function collecting our boys stop throwing that's knives right. at each other we're you, not you the wait woods. until you're away from medical <laughs> help until you do this kind of game so now of course we joke with grandma all the time when we're in the woods we're like hey don't be getting mad at nobody we're in the woods you said we're years allowed. ago we can, start, right. we can throw knives at each other again. This is okay now. <laughs> that is so funny. So, you so, know, yeah. you're not supposed to pull the knife out, right? Yeah, we did. So, for people that are listening, if you ever get a puncture injury, you should leave the thing wherever it's punctured into. Because you never know what you're going to call. Like, so someone gets a big piece of rebar through their chest, take an angle grinder and cut the rebar off and take them to the hospital with the rebar in their chest. Yes. Yes, I know that. You know, in their head, in their eye. Now, if someone gets something in their eye, the best thing to do is take like a pile of gauze and cut a slit so you build like a bridge around it, right? So it builds like a, like a, you get an inch thick of gauze and you cut a slit and you put it around the object and then tape it down tight so it kind of makes a stabilizing bridge so it doesn't move. Does that make sense? So yes. the eye doesn't wiggle. And then the other eye, always cover the other eye. Because if you don't, What's going to happen is they're going to be laying there on their back and someone's going to say something and they're going to look. And both eyes will move. That's interesting. So always cover the other eye. But yeah, you leave things in. I actually saw a video again just on that today where they said this is like, here's a good example. You leave things in. They had just a camera on someone's hand and they had a nail through the palm of their hand and they're in the emergency room because they had this, uh, the blue coverage, the backgrounds, I had the gloves on and they grabbed the nail and they pulled it out. As soon as they pulled it out, blood started squirting, like pulsing out of his hand. I'm like, oh, they just stuck their thumb on it and held it tight. I'm sure the guy made it, everything is okay, but that's a great example on good thing they didn't take the nail out, or is this guy's gonna have arterial bleeding going on and who knows what could happen? Yeah, Paris I think George I... wants to know where the old shoes at least. Well, they got thrown away. That was not newsworthy at, at the collector <laughs> family. I remember it because I was young and I couldn't believe it, but I don't even remember what happened. I don't remember if they walked him out. I do remember that Terry took it like a champ. I mean, I don't remember him screaming oh, yeah, he did. or anything. He's just like, well, well, Jason threw a knife through my foot. And, of course, we joked about playing again. And, of course, that just fired Grandma up even more. But Because you're not in the woods, Jason. We're not in the woods. But I got to <laughs> say, every time we had Thanksgiving at your house, we either shot blowguns. Your dad had a knife throwing competition one time on a we board. Had, yeah, we had but, knife throwing. We had Chinese stars throwing competitions. Yeah, we had we some had the amazing big competitions. Too. Remember, like, we had early blowguns. We yep. were early, Terry and us, you and me, were the early adopters of the bigger caliber blowguns. Once they started coming out with these cheap Chinese blowguns, like at gun shows, those aren't serious. We had the big ones that used the orange beads. Remember those? Yep, they were still 40 cal, though. So, like, the big, big ones now are, are five eights, like what Tucker has. I there thought they two- were bigger than what's available now. They were 40 cal? Yeah, they're still 40 cal, but we, we use the beads. And Terry used to make them and sell them. And so he used to make all his own configurations before the yeah. cones and all that stuff. But like what, what Tucker like the, has the orange now. beads on a string, and you'd heat up the wire, and you just push the yep. wire to the orange bead. And they had some mass to them. Now, we used to shoot at each other with just beads. Yep. And I got to tell you, they would sting something fierce. Now, I will, next podcast, I will try to remember to bring one of Tucker's 5.8s blowgun darts. And this thing looks like you'd kill a person. It is the nastiest looking thing you've yeah, ever seen. Are, it's called Big Boar. You can buy yeah. them like the Cabela's and stuff like that. Yeah, we've I, we've taken those and taken the bamboo ones, the bamboo skewers. Yeah. And played darts with them. So we're at my buddy's house, that like across his room into the entryway, using the dartboard on the wall with the bamboo ones sticking on the dartboard playing darts. That was fun. Yeah, there's, now, a, I, there's the skill to blow guns. And I equate shooting a, a bow, a bare bow bow, to being like a blowgun. We were oh, like, absolutely. well, can't you just look down the arrow and aim? I'm like, well, no, you're not looking down the blowgun and aiming. It's down lower. The arrow's down by your mouth. So blowgun. That instinctive feel of knowing that arc, the same as shooting archery without sights. 
Yeah. So for me, it's, it's like pointing your finger when you try to point your finger and cover something up. Yeah. It's very similar to aiming like that. And what I used to do with the kids when they were younger is we would take all their stuffed animals and make an obstacle course through the house and then set up a scoring system on the stuffed animals. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, uh, I still don't think it was me. I, 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 but it must've been, I don't know. My dad says, you know, when I was younger, he came home one time and found a whole cluster of like blowgun darts in the corner of the ceiling one time that knew I must've been training or practicing up there. But did he ever <laughs> tell you, I don't remember if he or Carolyn, my, my stepmom got hurt, but when I silicone sprayed the entryway as like a booby trap. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm seeing the comments here. Yeah, people are saying, Jared says, the knife game doesn't surprise me with these two. Remember, they almost catapulted Ryan as kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The best almost, one ever. Killed me. Almost Not catapulted, killed, you. killed me. Yeah, it would have been horrible. So I used to take uh, those blow guns, and I remember they were the thicker walled aluminum, and they yep. had like the camo cloth tape sometimes yep. on them with a big rubber like mouthpiece. Um, well, my dad, the fanciest thing we got with bow technology is he got an overdraw one year. So we still, you know, aluminum arrows, you know, Zwicky broadheads. Took our old Bitsenberger Fletcher and put them on, but we always shot bare bow in my family. And so he got an overdraw, which meant he could cut about, well, I don't know, what, an inch and a half off of an arrow? Yeah, an inch and a half, two inches. Yeah, so he cut those off, but they already had the inserts still glued in because at the time you used to have to glue in the inserts, right? With what, feral tight, I think was the name of it? Yeah, you'd so, get it hot, melt it yeah, on there. It was yeah, actually fun sitting exactly around the, the table and making arrows for the night, right? So you'd had all these inserts. I'm like, hey, I know what I can do with these. Uh, at the time, my stepbrother was, I think he might have been temporarily living at the house and he smoked. So he had cigarette butts out back. So a cigarette butt fits perfect in the back of a 2016 Easton yep. arrow. I'd rip off half the paper, I'd fluff the filter out. Okay. And I'd screw a field point in the front. So it was a very short, stubby, but very front heavy dart that would launch awesome out of those blow guns with my dad's air compressor nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> so I would put them in the back and take the you know the rubber tip of the air compressor blower nozzle, and I'd be launching these things across the backyard. Yeah, I don't know, man. We're lucky we're alive. I know. In fact, uh, God, we did so many fun things when we were. Little. I used to I mean, shoot. Do you ever shoot lighters with a pellet gun, Jason? Uh, we used to make flint bombs out of lighters, but no. I would take a rubber band and hold down the gas and then spark it so it would light. And you sit in the backyard with the pellet gun and shoot at it because the flame would be there. And once you'd hit it, it would give a little ball of fire once you blew it up. Those was, no, was really Tannerite targets for me. We used to do uh, things that you can't do anymore, especially with yeah, Strike like, Anywhere matches and stuff. But Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure they were quite incriminating. At least they would be now. It had to do with tennis balls or... Oh, yeah. Or, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the best thing we ever made was a fully automatic BB gun. Out of a sand blasting nozzle. Right. And just like a hopper of BBs on top of it. We'd take a CO2 cartridges, cut them, and fill them with BBs because they'd stick right on top of the... Where, instead of the sand coming through the bottom, we'd rotate the nozzle 180 degrees mm-hmm. and just let them filter into the into the so, nozzle. And, you know, they got rid of the Strike Anywhere matches because people were doing stuff like that. Yes. But did you know that the Strike on Box matches are just as cool? Do they work like that? If you mix it with the compound, that's the strike on surface. Oh yeah, yeah. So I won't, I won't <laughs> give it away. But if people want to go do their own research, you can shave <laughs> off with like a razor blade. You can shave like the strike surface to get the little like brown powder, and then you can take the pellet heads and very carefully mix the powders together. It's like mixing tannerite. And there's a guy online that talks about taking uh, like the round, like garage sale colored stickers. And then mixing a little bit of powder and putting some in the middle of one of the stickers and putting another sticker on it, you know, so sticky side to sticky side. So you have this little like one inch deal. And then you can go put it up on a target and shoot at the pellet gun. And it's like a tannerite target for a pellet gun. Huh. So you, you need to go do that, Jason. Go watch I'm, the video of V Safe. Yeah, have to check that out. You can still do some cool stuff with them. Now, to answer Doug's question, I personally have never seen anybody light a match other than on TV, but Either my I dad. My dad witnessed your dad do it two times out of three on three matches in a wash with a pistol. I don't know about that. My dad swears to it. He goes, there was a bet that he couldn't do it, and your dad lit two of them. 
Wow. So you have to ask him. You have to ask him about that. I don't believe it because my dad never told me. He would not have skipped that story. So well, you know, my dad used to always do the trick shots, like for betting. And my dad never bet on, never took money. But I'm the same way that my dad is in that I do better if there's even just a fun bet. Like I bet you can't do that. I bet I can. The more pressure in the moment, I think the better I do. Are you the same way, Jason? Yeah, I think that's just kind of in our family. I think everybody does that. The one person I see that the most in is my brother, Jared. I mean, especially in sports and stuff like that, he's he's got a, a unique push about him when the pressure's on. Uh, I lose most times in games against him because of it. Well, physical games, yeah. I mean, I remember one time, I think at Rick and Carol's property had there, the arm that dude had on him. I remember when we were, goof- <laughs> we were just goofing around the Nerf football and people are way far away. He's like, no, back it up. I'm like, it's a Nerf football. And that thing just whistles and took off. But yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, cornhole, uh, washers. It was just something about some people when the pressure's on, they do worse. And I think I, I, I almost will put pressure on myself in a moment just to make it happen. But dad would always do the shoot the bow behind the back. You ever see that the archery shoots? And so he loved oh, yeah. doing it. As a kid, it annoyed me. I'm like, come on, dad, stop it. Stop showing off. But he was great at it, and so he'd do stuff. He actually blew the center out of my boonie cap. Do you know that? No. We're talking smack at the Mormon Lake Archery Shoot, walking back on one of those dirt roads. You know how it is. You're kind of a little sweaty, a little dusty, you uh-huh. know, kind of tired. Do you want to go back to go get some of the carnival food stuff they have there? And we're talking about stuff. My dad has one of those rubber blunts. Got to be careful how you say that nowadays. A blunt, not a blunt like you guys are thinking, but a blunt arrow, <laughs> right? He's got a rubber blunt on the front of his aluminum arrow. And we're talking about it and joking. You know, he's telling stories about these great shots he made and gets the pressure on. He's like, all right, hey, Rye, throw up your hat. I'm like, no, I'm not going to throw up my hat. He's like, come on, throw up your hat. So I had one of those just army surplus boonie caps, right? So I take it and I huck the cap up in the air, kind of like a sideways Frisbee in between the pine trees. Dad pulls back and whack, blows the center out of the hat. And so... <laughs> proud of your dad but now you don't have a hat now you don't have a hat at least the button's not there anymore i don't know about the match thing is he sure is my dad because i'm serious yeah, I mean, yeah. I, my dad's got the same problem i do we like to we like to tell the stories about what we did so cool and i've never heard that so that's why i'm wondering and he's not necessarily a great pistol shooter my dad can shoot a pistol but i just if it was a bow i believe if you said he did it with a bow okay i believe you now but no, tis the story I was told. So to get a chance him. to ask him. I'll, in fact, I'll ask my dad and try to get the the whole story. I wonder if you could. I just think that uh, even a pellet would be so much velocity to just break the match right off. Now, I've seen them do trick shots on TV and, of course, split bullets, light matches. I've taken a bottle cap off of a bottle with a rifle before. Without breaking the glass? Yep. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I have it on video. We'll find it somewhere. Yeah, we we may have loosened the bottle cap. Like cracked the seal, right? So it was sitting there, but it was a root beer. It was an IBC root beer. It was out at the school in Arizona. I was teaching out there and we had the history channel or one of those channels came out and did one of their reality shows there of like a student going through the course. They wanted a bunch of B-roll of shooting. Extras were like, we don't know what to do. So we put a video camera out there and we put it at hundred yards. And I don't think I did it in the first shot. I think the first shot was a little too high. I don't remember, but I'll just, I won't make it up and say I did the first shot but it was at least the second one. I'm like, you know what? I just got to kiss it. So the bullet is barely kissing the edge of that top. I did it, hit it just right above it. And it lifted and sucked the top right off the bottle. And a little bit of foam still came out because it made the root beer foam a little bit, but the glass was perfect. <laughs> so that's probably that's the awesome. coolest, coolest trick shot I've done is open a beer at, at hundred yards. I don't think I've done any cool trick shots. Not that I can think of. I want to do some now though. Yeah. So a uh, swag idea. I appreciate you guys bringing it up. I'll try and get some swag going. I just got to get a better logo that you guys might want to do. And I got to get some serious interest because I don't want to do it and be stuck with a bunch of things because right. I think it's awesome. I love the fact that you guys want to support the show, um, but I think it's a little weird, honestly, because I haven't thought about it before. So it's a weird idea to me is I want to make sure that you guys really want something with it on there, but we'll figure it out, whether it's stickers or a hat or t-shirts or whatever you guys can think of. Well, if you we'll don't do it, it I'm going to make something anyway. All right, we'll figure out. I have patches. Like, I can't be that weird. I have t-shirts and, uh, like, the rubber rubberized, you know, Velcro patches for the Rifle Company logo. So, that can't, you know, I don't know. Jared Daniel says, who's the better shot, Ryan or Kyle Lamb? Uh, I don't know. I bet it would depend. I think there's situations where both Kyle and I would give each other a run for their money. 
Uh, when it comes to handguns, Kyle's definitely better than me. Um, I bet a lot of it has to do with I'm so rusty and out of practice. But even if I got up to my best speed, I think Kyle could still edge me with a handgun. He's just better. Um, we if there's a few of us shooting together, he and I will be kind of close. But yeah, he'll beat me. He's really good. Uh, rifles, I'm not sure. I know Kyle went to Sodic also, but I do a lot of rifle shooting too. Who knows? We'll do it sometime. Kyle and I were just texting today about how we want to do some videos, uh, just real quick informal videos, like videoed on a phone of trying to disprove or test some myths that people talk about. Like if you have three attackers, a lot of people say you got to shoot each attacker once before you go back to the first one to shoot them twice. Because uh, this theory makes sense. You know, why would you spend your time shooting the first one and the other ones aren't there? But I'm kind of with Kyle on this one is no, I'd rather pull out a gun shoot two or three times, get one down and then move to the next one. Cause people don't stop or necessarily even know they've been shot with one bullet, but it's just one of these things we hear repeated all the time. I've even heard it said in kind of a funny way. It's like, think when you get attacked by more than one person, it's like Thanksgiving dinner. Everybody gets a first before they get seconds. <laughs> right. So you give everyone I'm like, I don't know if hitting them one, 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 and then coming back is actually better. So we'll take a video out and we'll test it. And you guys will, will see Kyle shoot, shoot his handgun better than me. The one that impresses me, and I don't know the exact distance uh, when Hunter was doing her intern stuff, but it's like 20 or 25 feet. Somebody could, from a dead stop, run and get to you before you could pull a gun. Yeah, a lot of people call that the 21-foot rule. Yeah, um, and yeah. we tested it, and it was surprising. I actually got my gun out in time, but just barely. And getting the gun out means you got the shot off, and that's the movies. People don't die when they get shot. Right. So, right away, right? But it's, I mean, but, they, but they, they were they on hack, me. They hack with their machete for a good another 30 seconds. Yeah. Unless so, you've taken their brain out. It was very shocking to me because I thought, no way. Can you, from a dead stop, get to me in time? And it was, it was really shocking. I mean, I, I couldn't believe how fast it happened. Yep. Got to be careful. So let that be a lesson to you guys. Somebody can cover 21 feet a lot faster than you think they can. Yep. And it's gun doesn't necessarily mean you win. And nope. just because they got shot doesn't necessarily mean they're done. So right. it actually goes back to my whole theory that just because you have a gun doesn't mean that's the right answer either. You know, so many people focus on the offensive side of self-defense. Like, well, I have a gun for self-defense. So if I need it, I can, I can kill somebody. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that person needs to be killed to protect yourself. But maybe you just need to get away. Maybe you need right. to avoid the fight. Maybe you need to, right. you know, that kind of thing. So it's like we focus so much on the offense when you're supposed to be focusing on the defense. And really there's, uh, do you have a tourniquet nearby, in, at least in your vehicle? Do you know what to do if you got shot? You know, you sitting there dying and looking at the dead guy that attacked you means you still lost. Right. You won the gunfight, but you lost the whole purpose. So I don't know, something to think about. Yeah, so, anyway. no, it, it it really is, and I don't know. I mean, there there's so many people that don't even train with their guns, you know, to the point where the hesitation is enough to let them take it away from you. Maybe, yeah, or to not just shoot until the threat's really stopped. That's the right. other problem is people get what I call you know like range itis. You know, they'll pull out and go bang, 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 and then move on to the next target. It's like, wait a minute, who says the two shots stop that target from attacking you? You know, we used right. to do something really simple in our shoot houses. We would hang 550 cord from the catwalks when we'd go through a shoot house. And you'd take uh, just the cardboard E-type target. Or the E-type's the standard silhouette target. And you'd take your knife and you'd cut a small square-shaped hole with your pocket knife through the head. And then you could put a small square-shaped hole at the top of what you'd consider the kill zone in the chest. So like high up in the sternum. Okay. Right. And then you would run the 550 cord from the back of the head out the front of the face and then in through that sternum area and you'd blow up a balloon and tie the balloon on that 550 cord, that parachute cord. So therefore the balloon would keep the target hanging at target person height. And until you popped that balloon, the target wouldn't fall. But as soon as you popped the balloon, the target would fall automatically off the string. And so that was kind of cool to get you in the mindset of bang, bang. Oh, that should have gone down. It's not down yet. Bang, 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 bang. And staying in the fight until that target gets, gets down on the ground. So stuff like right. that's a good thing to think about. Nice. Yeah, it's a simple way to make a reactive target, right? You could make exactly. it yourself. You could take a, a wood target frame or PVC pipe, whatever you wanted, hang the parachute cord down and use balloons 
and change the size of the balloon and make it in different situations. Now, now you got a target you can train till it falls. Yeah, you probably would have done better with wood sights that lit up a little better in the light. Yeah, no doubt. Someone on here talked about you night sights with a match, and you could just light the front side on fire if you needed it, right? <laughs> exactly so, right. Pin, you could just get it, light it on fire, and then you got a, a lit front sight. So anyway, well, we I think we we covered a good night of the podcast. I love that you guys are on here. Right, we have, we have forty four people live right now. That's awesome. Thanks, guys, for being part of the live part of the show and i need you to do something for me i asked this a couple podcasts ago and a couple of you did it which i appreciate but i need more please right now if you're on facebook go to the mayday safety page if you like it if you like what we're doing with mayday safety go to the page and leave a positive review we could really use it right now um the first question out of schools and churches that love mayday is what do people think and i don't want you to make anything up i need you to say hey this is good this is useful in the situations or not if you think it is because that helps people understand that it might work for them uh also supporting all the rest of the stuff i appreciate it you know the articles on gun university or rocket ffl or rocket ccw and man i'm losing track of all the other things i have but if you've been waiting for the atf compliance course you can sign up now and it's a lot more expensive so the guys that pre-ordered it i think they got it for 20 bucks for a lifetime and Right now, the introductory low price that it's available is 185 bucks a year. So you guys got a screaming deal if you pre-ordered it. So I appreciate your patience. Nice. And it's, it's going to go up from there. So it'll probably be about 500 bucks a year. I know it's a lot of money, guys, but I'm giving like everything I tell my clients for legal information into here so that you could just log in whenever you want and your subscription's active and search for how to file this paperwork, how to do this, how to get ready for an ATF audit, yada, yada, yada. And I like that 4433 chapter so much, I'm including it in the employee versions of the course. So I think the employee versions are going to be like 20 bucks. So a gun store, when they get a new employee, they can say they can buy it for 20 bucks, sit the employee down for like an hour and a half, and I'll give them a race through of everything. And then they end the course with finding the problems in the 4473. So they get like a little certificate that says, I passed this course. And, you know, the, the gun store owner now knows at least that they know way more about 4473 than they would have before. So if you guys think that's cool, tell people about it. I appreciate it. Nice. Absolutely. So Jason, you're awesome, dude. Thanks for being on. Always, man. You know, I wouldn't miss it. Not even for foosball. All right, we need to get – you mentioned the guy for the 22 trainer might want to come on the show, so let's coordinate a show and get him on. See what he's I available. Will. It'll be a fun podcast. I will. He gave me his number and his info, and I will definitely get with him. All right, sounds good. Take care, buddy. All right, guys. Take care, everybody.